Yo, good afternoon, everybody. How you doing? This is your coach, Renz, and today we're gonna take a few minutes just to talk about Josephus Ben Mathia. Now, you may be asking yourself, why are we talking about Josephus Ben Mathia? Well, if you're of the conscious community or you're coming into consciousness, then this is a very important name that you should know about. The reason why is because many people like to come at you and want to fight you and argue and debate with you. And one of the things that they're, they, if they're scholarly or somewhat scholarly, they're gonna drag out Josephus ben Mathia and say that Josephus ben Mathia validated the historical Christ, yet he was not Christian himself. By in one of his passages, he wrote that there along that time frame there was a shepherd. And he was a man, if you could call him a man, because he produced many miracles and wonders, and he was surely the Christ and that he uh, and these Christians still follow him. Now, that's what they tout out, but it is highly debated that this information was added to Josephus' writings much later when Christians took over Roman, the Rome, took over Rome, when they became you know, an official Roman government, or part of the Roman government, when they became the Pope, when they um, established their, the Vatican and that sort of thing, that that was added. And I'm going to give you some evidence to make you realize why that was added. I've said in many videos, you have to understand the author in order to know what you're reading. The reason why I also say that is because the writings of Josephus ben Mathia, of his Wars of the Jews, the Antiquities of the Jews, and the Annals of Titus, these writings are the basis of Philo of Alexander's writings in order to start canonizing the Gospels. And you have to understand who Philo was as to why he would participate in this canonization because he was a Jew, he was a Greco-Roman Jew. You have to understand that from that point on, everything became, uh, you know, uh, stood on top of that foundation to finally create your the, what Christians has as a, as a canonized Bible. So let me give you a little bit of information on Josephus ben Mathia so that you will better understand him so that when somebody comes to you and they have that one little passage, that there's a lot more volume that you can add to show that Josephus was not, was not someone who would have written that. So here we go. So the first thing to understand is that Josephus was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was born into the priesthood. He visited Rome to theoretically, the, the story goes, he visited Rome to ask for the release of 12 um, poets, Jewish poets and rabbis from Nero. So he went there. I mean, and, and he went there to visit. Now, understand, not the Nero who was supposedly alive during the time of, of Jesus. No, not that Nero. Now, well, it's Augustus then Nero. So to let you know Josephus was born in 37 AD this is at least this is four years after the so-called death of, of Jesus so he would have never known Jesus all right let's understand it he would have never known him would have never met him would have done this by stories if he had written that piece of information but he did not and let me tell you why he did let me give you even more information as to why Jesus why Josephus didn't write right there um Josephus being born of a fair of a priest line uh, more than likely of the Pharisees believed that he that they needed to shake off the shackles of Rome that that he was more of a zealot but he was a horrible leader of the zealots of his faction of zealots after visiting Rome the first war of the Jews occurred and he was placed in charge of the Galilean army right the Galilean army was soundly defeated by Vespasian and his son Titus the reason why Vespasian and Titus were there because Nero had asked Vespasian to shut down the Jewish revolt because Vespasian had did such a great job of shutting down the Druids to understand how he shut down the Druids by destroying their story. He understood the Druids fault because of their story. So he came to Jerusalem, he came to Israel to shut down the Jews because Nero said we need to shut down because Nero knew that his time was being very limited and with the continuous Jewish uprisings in Judea, he needed to get this thing under wraps or he would be disposed as emperor, but we know he was disposed anyway. But how did he become disposed? What was the things leading up? Well, the fact that Nero was lavishly spending money doing all kinds of crazy things, blaming the um, folks for doing all kinds of stuff, you know, for burning down Rome when they knew he burned down Rome, it was, he, he, was, he was teetering. Vespasian was the number one general in Rome at the time. So, when Vespasian came, their mission, their mission, and there are going to be some things you're going to hear that's going to sound similar, and I want you to understand it. Understand it. Their mission began in, in Galilee. 
Who did they fight in Galilee? They fought the Messianic Jews that were led by Josephus ben Mathia. See, he was a priest, but he was also a general. That's how they did it back then. All right, so it'd be like Dr. King being a general in the army. That's how they did it back then. All right, so Josephus is fighting him. Josephus was not a good commander at all. He was not a good war general, war engineer. So their mission started in Galilee. Now, let me put something in your mind right now. The word for gospels is evangelicon or evangelicon. That's what it is in Greek. That's where it comes from, evangelical, which means not good news. It means good news of military victory. That's what Evangelion means. Good news of military victory. The word gospel means the good news of military victory. When somebody says they're, they're an evangelist, then they're somebody who's supposed to be giving you good news of military victory. That's what the word comes from. So that's what the word means. Don't really care what you change it into today. When it was written, that's what it meant. So the, 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 the ministry, the mission starting in Galilee is an evangelical story of military victory of the Romans. Now, when this victory occurred, the last part of the victory is that Josephus had him and about 40 of his people, his warriors, were in a cave. Everybody else is dead. 40 of his guys are in a cave. While they're in the cave, they decide we are not going to become symbols of Roman uh, victory. We're not going to become slaves to the Romans. Romans, we're none of that. We're going to make a suicide pact. Well, Josephus says, well, whoever draws the last, the smallest straw, they kill everybody and they got to off themselves. They agree. Josephus miraculously draws the final straw, the short straw. And he kills everybody else, but then he don't die. He doesn't kill himself. He doesn't uphold the pact. So when he doesn't uphold the pact, because this is the thing that you need to understand. Josephus is a survivor. He's a self-sustaining survivor. He doesn't uphold the pact. He's captured by Vespasian. He's now a prisoner of Vespasian and Titus, okay? So now that he's a prisoner of Vespasian and Titus, and this is in the, in the 60s, not the 1960s, but the 60s, right? He's, he's, a, he's been captured by them. Now, He's listening. Word is traveling. He's understanding. He had already previously been to Rome, so he understood a bit of the Roman mindset he, as he went there as a negotiator. So he understand a bit of the Roman mindset. So what we have is that he's listening, he's understanding, and he's also a priest, so he understands the Jewish story. And in doing so, at a certain point, he announces to Vespasian that I was given a vision from God. And in that vision from God, it says that you will become emperor. And the reason why God told me, because I am the messenger, and that the Jewish people will suffer under the Roman heel because they've been disobedient. And then he shows Vespasian the Jewish text that says that a Messiah will come out of Israel and that Messiah will become the leader, the, the, the world, a world leader. And so Vespasian hears this. And then soon after, Vespasian is called to Rome. And when he gets to Rome, Nero has been disposed and Vespasian becomes emperor of Rome. The Flavian dynasty has now began. So with that in mind, Vespasian says that, oh, this man, he understands this Jewish story. He will help me to conquer and shut down all the rest of the Jewish story. Why? Because the Jewish people are spread throughout the Roman Empire. They're causing rebellions in, 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 in Egypt. They're causing rebellions in, in Sumeria. They're causing rebellions all over the Roman Empire. And why? Why are they causing this rebellion? Because of their story because of their beliefs. You see, the Jews believe that there is only one God. The Romans generally don't care about that, but they say that out of courtesy, we need you to put a statue of Caesar. Well, the Jewish religion says that you can't have any graven images of God, anything on earth, uh, in, in the heaven above, in the sea below, or on earth. So, no statues of Caesar. It says that once a year, pay tribute, give offerings to the statue of Caesar, 
But the Jewish people is like, no, we can't do that. The Jewish people say that you must not go into the holiest of holies and the Romans don't understand why not. The Jewish people say also that we have to have, take rest on the Sabbath. The Romans work seven days a week except for a few Roman holidays. They don't understand that. So there's this constant conflict and the conflict is there because of the story. And the biggest story is the messianic warrior, the Messiah that will come and defeat the enemies of the Jews and establish Israel as a world leader. That storyline is what Vespasian must kill. So he make Josephus his advisor and advisor to his son Titus, who is now the top general in the Roman Empire. So Titus now has the task of shutting down the rest of the, Jew, Masonic, the, the, the Messianic movement in, in Judea. Now, I want you to understand, Vespasian um, is, is needs to put this down. Here are some of the stories that Josephus writes that you will sound similar to. You. He writes a story about how there's a battle, at, uh, at, there's a battle on the sea, on in one of the seas, and it, and on the land, and and after the battle is complete and the Jewish people lose, that Titus calls his men to him and say, follow me, do not be afraid and follow me for I will make you fishers of men by tossing spears at the, the, the people, the Jewish people who are trying to get back to land and they stab them as they were trying. Yeah, have you ever been coming off the beach, off, you know, out of the water onto the beach? You're not moving that fast, right? You're not able to zig and zag, but they were, so they were throwing spears and they made them fishers of men. He records Titus when he came to Jerusalem that he encircled Jerusalem and he said we must find a watchtower before we enter the city. So every man must have a watchtower. He also said that Titus got to Jerusalem and in this siege of starving them out, he said, pull up all the fruit trees so that they won't have any fruit so that the trees would be barren. We have the story where Yeshua said that since this fruit fig tree is not producing fruit, it should be picked, pulled up. Even though it wasn't producing fruit and it wasn't in season to produce fruit, I think the bigger miracle would have been to produce fruit when it's not in season instead of pulling it out because logically it doesn't produce fruit. But anyhow, he says pull up all the fruit trees and, and, and that he enters Jerusalem under fan, great fanfare. He's on the great fanfare. He destroys the temple, leaving not one stone on top of another. And we know that story has been told. Now, why do these things seem like prophecy? It seems like prophecy because the, the, the Vespasian way, the Flavian way is to backdate stories. It's to backdate stories. Let me give you two examples of backdating stories. So they backdate their stories in order for them to look like prophecy, to look like that's what happened and we fulfilled that prophecy. So the, the stones, you know, so to, to move the Jesus story, so when Philo takes over the story, when Philo of Alexander takes over the story and move the story back to 30 years prior into the Julio-Claudian, into the time frame of Augustus and Nero, when he moved that story back, it works because now it looks like Vespasian was prophesized. It looks like Titus was prophesized. And the reason why they need to be prophesied is because one of the other duties, the Roman emperor must be made into a god. You see, the Julio-Claudians all became gods, so the Flavians must become gods as well. So when you approach the imperial court, the imperial council, in order to deify Vespasian, Titus needs writings that deify his father. So if you backdate the coming Messiah story and present that to them, Vespasian becomes deified. And then Titus becomes the son of a god. And that is exactly what happened. And then for Titus to have done everything that it says that the Jesus character would have done, it would then deify Titus as well. You see, you have to think larger than your book. You have to think geopolitical power. Now, why would the Philo, why would the Alexanders do this? The Alexanders were the tax collectors in Egypt for the Romans. They were a Greco-Roman family who was, they were a Jewish Greco-Roman family. So they were the tax collectors. It was, at one point, they were the richest family in all of Rome. So they had to maintain their power, right? Their money, follow the money. Why would the Herods participate in this? Because they were a Hellenized, Jewish Hellenized family that was placed in charge of Israel. And they were the tax collectors. So they had to make sure they money. Matter of fact, a daughter of the Alexander's family, Be Be Princess Beatrice, married a Herod, but then was the 
mistress of Titus. So these people are all intermingled. So they had to shut down their story. Now, one of the other things that, that Vespasian did was that he ordered all the Jewish texts to be brought to Rome and burned and destroyed. This is why the Dead Sea Scrolls had to be hidden. And that was done by the Essenes or the Quinin. But understand there are different factions. There's the Pharisees, there's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, and the and the and the um, the Quinin. So these people, they weren't all friends. They communicated with each other, but they weren't all friends. They didn't all believe the same way. Like the Pharisees thought you should negotiate, whereas the Zealots thought that you should fight. The Koinans thought that you should fight the Romans. So they're a little different um, as far as the Jewish groups. So these are different Jewish groups. So uh, Josephus gets to a point where he completely becomes Romanized. He, 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 he gives up his, he, he becomes a Roman citizen, goes and lives in Rome in the palace of Vespasian, gets an apartment there. He's given a Jewish wife who was a prisoner of war, which goes against the rabbinic um, teachings. She divorces him after a while. Then he marries another Jewish woman, but she they, they break up. He, that marriage don't work. And then he marries another Hellenistic Jewish woman, and they have children and all that sort of thing. But So he goes through this process. He's living in Rome. It's kind of like, think about Paul got knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus. Josephus got knocked off his horse in, in his defeat at Galilee, and then he goes and live in Rome, and then he does all his writings from Rome, just as Paul. And in the writings of Paul, who is one of the people? Now, remember, he's the he, he's he's the uh, mentor over Titus for handling the Jewish issue, the Jewish problem. And Ty, and Paul writes a book called Titus. So I'm just saying, we're not going to go there, but I'm just saying, you know, there's there's too much too many coincidences here. But like Philo, but the Philo of, Alex, Philo of Alexander is the one who began to canonize your, your biblical books, right? And call them the gospel of these, you know, good, good news of military victory. But you need to understand that about Josephus. If Josephus declared Vespasian to be the Messiah, the coming Messiah who will become a world leader to which Vespasian did become a world leader, he did come out of Israel, if, this faith, if Josephus claimed him to be that person, then of course the writings that were added about Jesus being the Messiah, being the Christ, would be different. And understand, Christ is a title that means anointed one. How many pastors are running around talking about they're anointed? How many people are running around talking about they're anointed? When you say you're anointed, then you're saying you're Christ. Okay, that you're, you're, you're Christ title, you're Christos. All right, so look that up before y'all start talking about it. But anyway, this message is really for people who are coming into consciousness and they and, and they come up against people who think that they know something and they've taken some information, they've twisted it just to fit them. I'm just telling you what it is. I, I didn't write an opinion. This is not an opinion. This is what Josephus wrote. Josephus wrote that Vespasian was the Messiah that would come out of Israel and become a world leader. And that's what happened. Josephus wrote about Titus destroying the temple, and that's what happened. We know that Josephus backdated, backdated the information. That's just what happened and put it, placed it in the time frame of Augustus and Herod, I mean, Augustus and Nero. That's just what happened, not my opinion, not my opinion. And that's why it is hotly debated that he wrote about a historical Jesus. He would not have written that the historical Jesus was the Christ. If he would have, it would have he would have been, the Romans would have killed him. You have to understand, the Romans, they like you to be pro-Roman, but they don't like you to be um, a yes man or a kiss butt. You, but you can't be solely so against the Romans. You can write the story and then and the Romans have to go through the hero journey, if you will. They have to go through, they, they don't mind if you take the Romans through where they, they struggle, but then they come out victorious. They don't mind the hero journey. So he had to take him through the hero journey, but he couldn't be totally against the Jews because he couldn't make the Jews look too weak either. Otherwise, the hero journey is, is not as good. The storyline, the narrative doesn't sound as good. And people back then were expected to understand allegories as well. So he can write, write it allegorically. So it, it, there was a lot, he had to be like in a sweet spot middle in order for the people to accept him. And he, was, and he perfected, he wrote, and he was in that sweet spot middle. But this writing, that says that he knew that he, he there was Jesus and he was the Christ and the Christians. Josephus lived from 37 AD to around 100 AD. Wasn't nobody running around calling themselves Christians. 
during the time frame that he wrote Antiquity of the Jews, War of the Jews, and the Annals of Titus, they, and it's Annals of Titus, but he would have never written though. He would not have written Christian, okay? Let's understand that. Term wasn't around, wouldn't have wrote it. Um, and like I said, Philo put together the first, a couple of your gospel books and started to canonize the, the books uh, anyway. Uh, and he was, and that's somebody who is pro-Roman as well, which is why when you read your New Testament, you see that it's very pro-Roman. The Romans don't look bad in the New Testament. They look pretty good. The Jews look halfway bad. Matter of fact, there's another thing. The Jesus story says that a house divided will fall. When Titus came to Jerusalem, like I said, there were Pharisees, Sadducees, there were Coinin, there were Zealots, you know, or, and you can place the scenes in there. But it seems kind of like they lived off by themselves. They were kind of isolationists. But one of the things that Titus said is that a house, that Jerusalem is divided. The factions of Jerusalem are divided. And a divided military will fall. That's one of the things Titus said. And then you get the same, a similar thing said about Jerusalem when Jesus comes to Jerusalem as well. So I just want you guys, I want, I want my conscious community people to have a little bit more of understanding of and that's what this video is about. It's, it's, it's not for you if you come here to argue um, that, because I'm not Christian, so I'm not here to argue the validity of if it, it's a Christian or not. I'm just giving information to people who recognize that, recognize the story, recognize that it more it, that these are compilations based on what somebody else wrote, based on a Roman emperor, and then they've been, and then after you dispose of the emperors, and now you have the 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 the, um, the Vatican running things, and you have government. You have uh, just you just ran by a Senate and all that because after the Flavians were done, now it is we we are trying to um, take this and make it into this legendized this legend story so that all the Gentiles that that Rome can now conquer that the Church can now conquer without army. You understand that was the that's why it changed into a. Jesus story because they needed something that could conquer without army. You didn't need it to be the Roman Emperor anymore. You needed to be the mind. You needed to conquer the mind by having people believe in a hell, having people believe in that they need this salvation from a third party, that somebody came and did and died for their sins. You needed all of that. So you aggrandize the story later on. You legend make it legend. Now, oh, I said I'll give you a second example of people backdating stories. Um, Constantine, when he destroyed Maxentius, when he beat Maxentius at the bridge of Moldova, he he first just beat him, did his ark, put Apollo and Mithra on his ark, had nothing, no Christian nothing on that ark, and even though Philo had previously made Christian symbolisms of like the fish and the anchor and things like that, none of that was on his ark. But then in 313, when he's writing the Edict of Milan and he's talking to some Christian bishops and he's trying to get these Christian Orthodox, he was only interested in the Orthodox. It's not like he was, he was not interested in the Messianic Christians. He wasn't interested in the Gnostic Christians. Only the Orthodox Christians who supported Rome, who thought that Christians should be good Roman citizens, not people looking for, you know, a free state, not people looking for a free mindset. He was only in support of the Orthodox Christians, but Constantine then backdated and changed the story, and this is this is why Caesar, um, not Caesar, <laughs> Eusebius of Caesarea, he changes. Then the first time he wrote about the Mo when he first recorded the Moldovian bridge battle, there was nothing about a vision of Jesus in the sky. There was nothing about painting shields across on the shield. There was nothing about being Constantine being visited you know, in a vision by Jesus. None of that. There was none of the, in this symbol you will conquer. None of that was in there, but it wasn't until this meeting, this dinner in 313 with these Christian Orthodox bishops that he tells this story differently and backdates it to the, when he had the battle. He didn't say that I did have this vision yesterday. He backdated and make the battle a part of it so that it's a big, good story. See, look, I know that you guys' religion is valid because I conquered in your name and your God and this sort of thing because I told you before in another video he could not utilize Apollo for a religion for everybody in Rome because the poor people the rich people wouldn't accept that and nor could he use Mithra because the upper middle class people wouldn't accept that but he could use the Christians 
because it's something that everybody could have accepted. Your money didn't matter. So he started to court the Christians, but that's when he backdated that story. So anyhow, and Constantine is a flavor, by the way. He's a great, great grandson. Well, a great, 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 he's a great, great, great adopted grandson of Vespasian. So he's not even blood, he's like an adopted kid. But he's a flavor. You know, look up his name, look up Constantine's name. He's a flavor. But anyhow, and like I said, Josephus became a flavor. But that, I want you guys to have that piece of information. I hope that has been beneficial to you. Please support me on Patreon. Um, also, when I do some live, live videos, um, please support me there as well. And if you want to do spiritual coaching or leadership coaching or business coaching with me, life coaching, then connect with me and I'll be more than happy to work with you because you always have to free yourself to be yourself because your greatness is non-negotiable.